Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another in our series of conversations with participants in the 85th annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in Quantitative Biology. This year, the symposium had as its theme biological timekeeping. I'm uh, John Ingalls. I'm the uh, director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press and the co-founder of the lab's preprint servers, BioArchive and MedArchive. And our guest today is Steve Horvath, who is a professor of human genetics and biostatistics at UCLA. Steve, welcome to this conversation and many thanks for agreeing to do it. Yeah, uh, thank, you. thank yeah. you for hosting me and thank you for BioArchive. I put all well, my, my preprints on BioArchive. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, we very much appreciate that support. That was not the, the topic of this conversation, but we appreciate it nonetheless. Um, I did want to say you were especially chosen to be the final speaker at this year's symposium, and, and you, you justified that by giving a spectacularly interesting talk. But um, before we get into the substance of that, um, maybe you could just tell the audience a little bit about your background. Um, you have an undergraduate degree and a PhD in mathematics. So I'm, I'm curious when, when math, mathematics PhDs have many opportunities to do things in this life. So I'm uh, curious as to what to move, well, stay in academia and also move into biology and medicine. Well, I'll start out by saying that when I was young, I made many mistakes. You know, I wish I had a mentor who would have guided me. I mean, I, on some level, I, I, um, I wasted many years, you know, <laughs> being mm. distracted. And um, yeah, so people should never emulate me in any way. And, <laughs> and always do the opposite of what I did, you know. But um, but yes, it is true that I did receive a PhD um, actually in mathematics and mathematical physics. And um, I actually graduated at a time where there were no jobs for mathematicians. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but apart from that, I was um, burned out on mathematics. So I, I wanted to do something much more applied. So then I actually retrained. I got another doctorate in um, biostatistics and statistical genetics. So I was very interested in genetics research. I'm really a quantitative person by training, bioinformatics, biostatistics, you know, and um, yeah, but I had a lifelong interest in aging research, anti-aging research, you know, so, um, so after I received tenure at my university, University of California, Los Angeles, I um, said, well, let's go into the field that um, um, really got me started and, and, and which mm -hmm. was really aging research, biomarkers of aging, you know, but yeah, for others, I really, want to say don't waste too much time with education it's much better to start research you know as opposed to spending many years doing coursework you know um, so <laughs> well Ed, that's I, I was going to ask you this question later but since you brought it up um i mean i i'm very struck by the breadth of interest in your lab you, you list systems genetics biomarkers as you say but also machine learning uh, GWAS, uh, epigenomics, a, a, a lot of things. So um, with the, the idea that uh, among the audience for these kinds of uh, conversations, there are young people, there are early career researchers. And so what do, you, what do you say to them? Who are you looking for to join your group? What would you say to them if you were interviewing me as a, as a potential candidate to join your lab? What do you think the skill set is these days? You know, I can use people with very different skill sets. You know, I've, on the one hand, um, I mentor MD, PhD. So these people have more clinical training even, you know. Mm. Um, also a lot of biologists, you know, um, molecular biology. I'm in the department of human genetics. I also uh, recruit geneticists. On the, on the other hand of the spectrum, given my... Um, past uh, life as a mathematician. I actually also work with mathematicians, you know. Mm. Um, what I tell people nowadays um, is that you must be interested in anti-aging research, you know, because uh, my projects are all about that topic. And um, I do mentor people who have 
more theoretical interests, but conversely, I'm also involved in human clinical trials. I'm heavily involved in um, mouse genetic studies, you know, so um, in vitro studies, you know. Yeah, sorry, it's, it doesn't sound very focused, but the one word is longevity, <laughs> aging, yes. you know, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, no, I think, I think that's such an exciting sort of area, and I'm, I'm sure you, you do attract a lot of people with different kinds of interest. That's a, that's a very uh, good segue because you were really specifically asked to talk at the symposium about your work with methylation-based epigenetic clocks and invertebrates. And, and I should say that, that that clock is often called the Horvath clock, which is a, a, an honor that not, not everyone gets in, in, ex, in experimental science. So I wondered if you could tell the audience briefly about that clock and and how it works, and then we'll get on to its application, which is so interesting. Yes, well, you know, when it comes to epigenetic clocks, there are, in my uh, language, three different versions, you know. So, um, and, and this recapitulates maybe the history of the field of epigenetic clocks. Um, for me personally, it all started around the year 2010, when I analyzed a saliva methylation data set, you know, um, that had been collected for a totally different um, application in my, um, which was study homosexuality, you know, but, um, mm. um, and I mentioned it because I never wanted to work on methylation, you know, so, <laughs> because um, I only got roped into methylation because this particular data set was very interesting to me, sexual orientation. And um, so I analyzed it and we found no signal at all, nothing publishable. But at the time I was already extremely interested in the development of biomarkers of aging. So I had all the software scripts ready and I said, let me just try whether methylation actually relates to aging, you know. And the rest is really history because uh, within five minutes of doing the analysis, I realized, oh my God, you know, there are these mm. huge aging effects in saliva. That, and then this paper was published in 2011 and um, in, it is the first epigenetic clock in the modern definition of the word, you know. The word mm. epigenetic clock has been used in many different contexts. Sometimes people refer to epigenetic clocks as aging effects in methylation. And if we take this very broad definition of epigenetic clocks, then one should refer to studies from the 1960s, you know, the mm -hmm. 70s. So it's well known actually uh, for decades, it has been well known that age has a strong effect on methylation. Um, but my personal definition of an epigenetic clock is really a multivariate predictor of chronologic age or mortality risk, you know. And if we use that definition, um, this first saliva clock was published in 2011. And, but then I, of course, was very interested in passing an important hurdle. Could one develop such clocks that apply to many different tissues? <laughs> yeah. And why, and why, so the so-called pan tissue clocks. So why is that interesting? Because it comes back to what is aging, you know? And the question is, does it occur in all tissues and cell types? And if you ask that question, you naturally come to the question, well, can we measure aging in many, many different tissues? And so, the, to, and again, methylation data really allow you to do that, um, which is one of, I call it the first miracle of methylation. You can build pan tissue clocks. I call it a miracle because it's, the same cannot be done for transcriptomic data, proteomic data, you know, meaning a single formula <laughs> that applies to all tissues. And so this, this then, uh, uh, but these are still what I call first generation clocks because they are really meant to measure chronologic age, you know. And um, yeah, so that, um, so that was 2013. And then, but then of course, people who conduct clinical trials, 
they want more. They want that clocks measure mortality risk, morbidity risk, that they relate to frailty, you know. Yeah. That then give, gives rise to these so-called second generation clocks. Um, you will often hear me talk about the so-called grim reaper clock, or we call it grim, grim age. And this mm. is now a, a methylation-based estimator of mortality risk. It works remarkably well um, for that purpose, you know. And um, yeah, but uh, coming now to the talk that I presented, it was really mainly about the third generation clocks and these clocks across species barriers, you know. And um, in certain ways, th this is this is a miracle, you know, because mm. I, I spent quite a lot of time trying to develop clocks that would work in humans and mice and just very simple you take human liver transcriptomic data you take mouse liver transcriptomic data and you just try to build a clock that works in both i personally failed at that you know so um why because it's transcriptomic data you know but um but then with methylation and using these very conserved regions of dna it turns out that this task is actually very easy, you know, and um, and then um, but then the next question is well, if you succeeded at building a dual species clock, human and mice, for example, or human and rat, um, can you um, or you hear the dog? We have a <laughs> we have a human dog clock that applies to humans and dogs very well, <laughs> as if on cue. That's, key, that's <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> Uh, good sound effects. <laughs> I have a Pomeranian, so yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, but but yeah, you can build these universal clocks that even apply to marsupials, right? We have, uh, yes, uh, so, yeah. I mean, on some level, it's simply unbelievable that this works, but it works, you know, and, and it tells so you us haven't, that... Uh, mm -hmm. You haven't found a vertebrate species or class that it doesn't work on yet. You mentioned you were waiting for some data on monotremes. Yeah, I, you know, to be very precise, I, I really talk about um, mammals, big difference. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> so, um, and because for mammals, I have data and results that show it works, you know. But now um, we have started uh, actually to look at vertebrates. So um, I... Um, but none of the data have reached my desk, you know. So, uh, um, what are exciting vertebrates, tortoises, you know, they can live a couple of hundred years, yeah. Yeah. Um, or amphibians. People are very interested in regenerative studies, you know, for example, in frogs or salamanders. Yeah. I was you know? going so, to ask you about that. Yeah. So, uh, I it's it's on my to do list. Um, I'm expect um, actually a couple of people already submitted DNA samples, but I, I just have zero data. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hopefully it will work. You know. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> well, it's it's certainly amazing that you can do this with the degree of precision that that you can. Um, but going back to the uh, the question of tissue differences and and its value in, in human medicine. Um, I mean, the obvious question, obvious, is, is about what happens in cancer um, when, you, when you compare tumor tissue with, with normal. Do, do you see changes in the, um, in the aging pattern there? Yeah, the, I mean, we see profound changes. I, uh, in short, cancer, in essence, breaks the epigenetic clock, you know? And um, it depends on the t cancer type, actually. So certain cancers completely disrupt the methylation pattern. So you can't even measure aging anymore, you know. Mm. Um, other cancers, I, the clocks still apply to some extent. They still reflect chronologic age. Um, but yeah, and it's complicated. Um, so even um, let's uh, talk about um, breast cancer. There's so-called uh, luminal breast cancer that are based on uh, steroid receptor mutations, estrogen receptor, um, or PR, you know, and, um, and, and then conversely basal uh, or triple negative breast cancers. 
and they have opposite behaviors according to epigenetic clocks. Mm -hmm. So luminal breast cancer shows positive age acceleration, a basal triple negative breast cancer, negative age acceleration. Oh. So uh, cancer is very complicated. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, what, and what about the stage of development? Is there any sense that that, that change in the clock is itself a biomarker for a transformative process? Um, yes, um, interestingly, um, epigenetic clocks often track developmental stage and also even cell differentiation stage. You know, you, you take an iPS mm. cell, you differentiate it into a neural precursor and then, you know, so you see a little bit of an increase in epigenetic age with stage. Um, however, it would be false to say that um, epigenetic clocks um, are strongly correlated to cell maturation or development. Um, and I know that because um, one of my collaborators, Tom Ree from the University of Washington wrote a very nice paper mm -hmm. where he looked at um, fetal retina and retinal cells during development. And um, sure enough, I mean, he, he found some uh, relationships, but some there were also discrepancies. Mm. Um, so here, his paper is entitled Synchrony and Asynchrony <laughs> of Epigenetic <laughs> Clock and Development. And that title kind of summarizes um, uh, um, right. that finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in your in your abstract, you mentioned uh, clinical trials as you as you did a um, yes. moment or two ago. So um, could you just tell us a little bit about how this concept is being employed in clinical trials? Yes, yeah, so I'm very happy that people already found grim age, for example, uh, useful for um, really evaluating anti-aging interventions in humans. Mm. And um, maybe to explain the background, imagine you have a magical treatment that reverses biologic age. Um, you need to convince your peers and yourself that it actually works, right? <laughs> and um, in theory, um, um, it, that's certainly feasible in a model organism. You take a mouse, you administer the treatment, and then you show the mouse lives a year longer than it should, you know? <laughs> and, um, so these and are that, things like calorie-restricted diets. And, and As an example, exactly. So there's very nice results in mice and Incidentally, the National Institute on Aging offers that they have a so-called interventional testing program in mice, you know, mm. so that works. And why does, why can one do it? Well, because mice live short lives, relatively speaking. In humans, totally different situation. What would you want to do in humans? You have a treatment, you administer it to, a, let's say, 50-year-old people. You follow them for 40 years and you say, whoever got that treatment, they ended up living five years longer, you know, or, yeah. or you track morbidity onset. Long story short, not doable. And so you need bio, why not doable? Too expensive, you know? So, um, so we need these biomarkers of aging and more precisely, we need surrogate outcomes. It's a, it's a, it's a surrogate endpoints, you know? Mm. That's really what's needed, you know? And the whole aging community is aware of it. It's, it's a holy grail of uh, biomarker studies, develop surrogate endpoints. And when I meet with my uh, colleagues and collaborators at aging conferences, we will have days of discussions about that topic. And um, now um, the consensus view would be that you need multiple biomarkers, you know, so um, not uh, not just epigenetic biomarkers. Yeah. And that's where the debates are, what biomarkers should be part yeah. of that uh, battery of tests, you know, and, um, and you can think of, I, I mentioned things like walking speed, of, uh, lung volume, yeah. um, so the, but also then molecular biomarkers. You could imagine proteomics or mitochondrial function and, and so on. Um, now, my 
personal angle is of course to use epigenetic clocks as one of the biomarkers. Um, and um, I, I think it's fair to say that the science is so strong that um, one, many anti-aging clinical trials should use methylation as a readout. Um, I want to say we are at a point where you need a justification why you do not use it. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I I I don't believe methylation should, uh, is a necessary readout in all studies. You know, um, but if you have a run of the, I call it a run of the mill anti aging interventions where you don't know too much about it, you should certainly collect EDTA blood tubes. You know, and uh, yeah. Um, and so why do I make, why do I think the field is there? It's really that cross-sectional studies have established without a doubt that methylation predicts lifespan, you know, yeah. and, um, but more than that, there are now longitudinal studies, you know, that already show that, uh, uh, provide first glimpses that the rate of change in methylation also is predictive, you know, and, um, so various, studies that uh, coming to the question of causality, you know, to me, they look encouraging. Um, I wouldn't say it has been nailed yet, you know, um, because we're still waiting for additional longitudinal studies that are coming online, but um, all the unpublished results that I've seen, they, they look very strong, you know, so, mm. so yeah, and um, yeah, and we already applied um, the grim age clock to a phase one clinical trial in humans and uh, we published it um, this was a study by greg fahey who works on thymus regeneration and mm. he had a very nice uh, study where um, the results were very uh, promising and they showed age reversal by two and a half years and um, but the study was phase one, you know, uh, yeah. it was a phase one study, which is meant to show safety. It was never meant as an yeah. efficacy study. Yeah. And um, but now I'm very happy that Greg Fay and Bobby Brook are doing um, a phase two clinical trial. And um, so hopefully the data uh, will corroborate these findings. You know, so. Well, yeah. that's that's a that's a great note to end this conversation on, Steve, such an optimistic one. Um, I might, we could talk about this for much longer, but uh, thank you very much indeed, once again, for um, this conversation and also for your wonderful contribution to the symposium. Thanks thank you. It was a real pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take now. care. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.